Hello, and welcome to this problem-solving video. In this video, we're going to be talking about energy, work, and power, as they're all very interrelated. And we're going to set up the problem that we want to think about by looking at this energy diagram, which is another closely related topic. So to do that, we need to make sure we understand what this diagram is telling us. And so there's a few questions that will take us through understanding the diagram. And then we'll look at how do we get work in the context of energy, and how do we get power from that. So here on the right is an energy diagram. The y-axis is energy, and the x-axis is position. So it's just plotting energy as a function of position. And then we've plotted two curves. The orange one is just telling you that the total energy in the system is a fixed value. And the blue curve is telling you how the potential energy varies as a function of position. If you happen to be at that position, what potential energy do you have? So the first question that we have to address is this one asking us, where can the object possibly exist? And in order to understand that, we just need to think about the definition of what it is we're plotting. So this total energy, what is that? Well, that's just the sum of the potential and the kinetic energies. So that's cool. We've got two of those things plotted, which means we can figure out the third. We can figure out that the kinetic energy is the energy minus the potential. Now here, when we start doing this, that's all well and good. That's certainly obvious. The kinetic has to be the difference. So how does that help us figure out where this object can exist? To make that extra step, we need to put in that we know, regardless of the situation, whatever object this is, whatever potential energy we're talking about, the kinetic energy is always 1 half mv squared. Now, if you look at that, certainly a half is greater than or equal to 0. m is also greater than or equal to 0, because we don't have anything that has a negative mass. And v squared, because it's squared, has to also be greater than or equal to 0. So if the kinetic energy is always greater than or equal to 0, and kinetic energy is equal to total energy minus potential, then we know that e minus u is greater than 0 in order for this to be a realistic situation, which in turn means that E is greater than U. And so now we have a nice criterion by which we can decide where these objects can exist. They can only exist anywhere where indeed the potential energy is less than the total energy. So that's those shaded regions on this plot. OK, so now let's ask something more exciting. Where are the equilibrium points? Now, there's nice mathematical derivations of what the gradient of this potential energy line means, but we can just rationalize it, conceptualize it. Let's pretend that we're talking about a situation where the potential energy that we're describing is gravitational potential energy, in which case it's just mgh. Which means that this plot, aside from factors of m and g, is just a plot of height as a function of position as we go along. So what does that mean? Well, that literally is the landscape on which you're going to try to place an object. So if your object happens to be a marble, then this is really obvious then what it's going to try to do. If you place it on one of these sloping edges here, it's going to roll down the slope. All right. So the slope of this line is telling us whether or not the object will want to move. Another way of thinking about this is just this idea that the universe is lazy it wants to get to the lowest potential energy possible, so it'll always try to move down in these plots if it can. So from here to move down, it needs to move to the right. Then it will be moving up, so it's not clear whether or not it'll move up. It depends on how much energy it has in total. But it's always trying to find these little points, uh, the low points in potential energy. Okay, And in particular, we can realize if the slope is zero then, then there's no preference to move in any direction because you're sitting at something where there's no sort of slope down which to roll. So if the slope is zero, that's going to be our equilibrium points. And so we can mark those in nice and easy. Now, the next exciting question, of course, to ask is which one of them are stable points of equilibrium? So if we think about these things and we look at this point here, 
Well then, it becomes pretty clear that if I put some object there and I perturb it slightly, say, to the right, well, it's going to come from here and it's going to roll this way, which means it'll roll down this slope and into that point. Okay. On the other hand, if I perturb it from here, it'll do the opposite and roll down that way. So that point is clearly not stable. What about this point here? So that point is a bit more tricky. That says if I perturb to the left, this way, then I'm actually perturbing up in potential energy, and so I want to roll back down to where I was. But once I do that sort of motion, I won't just stop when I roll back. I'll end up keep rolling down along there. Okay. So that is then eventually going to reach far away from this point that I started from, so that again is unstable. And similarly for the other flat one to the right, and the other um, top of the hill there. So I can take those guys out, and I can erase the um, little things that I drew to make it clear. The only points that are stable are those points down at the bottom of any of these little valleys, because that's where the ball is going to roll to if it's a ball, and we're thinking about these as being hills and valleys. Um, for real. And that conceptual motivation actually holds true. You're always trying to find lower potential energy, as we said, so you're always going to be moving, and then you're looking at a local minimum. That's where your stable points are. So then, okay, let's suppose that the particle happens to be over at x equals 10, so that's sitting on one of these flat things. It's moving to the left. Describe its motion. So that's what we've just said um, in analyzing this other point that's like it. If from over um, here we start to the left, well, that means we'll be perturbed in such a way that we've moved to a point where it's preferable to roll back to the right. In fact, if we're talking about this amount of energy, it is sitting there moving left. It'll reach that point where the intersection occurs with the total energy, so all the energy is potential. And then it'll go back and roll down move there, up the line, stop there again, because now its energy is all potential again, then it'll convert that back to kinetic and move back around. Okay, so it's just going to oscillate between those points of intersection with the total energy line. All right, so now, since it's oscillating between those, we know that farthest left we get is point A, and that point where we have the lowest potential energy, and therefore the maximum kinetic energy, is point B. So you want to know the magnitude of the work done by the source of this um, potential energy on the object as it goes from A to B. So first off, what does that question mean? Well, we're asking about how much work does the force that gives rise to that potential energy do? So if this was gravitational potential energy, then the work that we're now considering is how much work does gravity do as it makes the ball roll down the hill from sitting up there at point A and getting all the way down to point B. Now, to answer this, it's really easy when we think about work in terms of what it does to energy. So remember, we've got the work energy theorem that tells us that actually the net work, which in this case is just the work done by whatever is causing this potential energy, that network is equal to the change in kinetic energy. So the work done is delta k. And some of you may also remember that for a conservative force, which is one that gives rise to a potential energy, the work is equal to minus the change in potential. Okay. So we can use either one of these to figure it out. So we just look over at this axis. So down over at point B, maybe we're talking about something like, I don't know, 0. Point, looking at that scale, 0.25-ish joules. And when we're at point A, our potential energy, so this is U at B, at A, our potential energy is just this sort of 
joules. And so then we'll just take the difference. So which way do we need to take it? Well, it's supposed to be the negative of u final minus u initial. And our final point is actually point B. Our initial point is point A. So it's the negative of um, 0 0.25 minus 2.5. And therefore, it's something like 2.25 joules. All right. So that is how easily we can get work from this energy. These two equations are very important, um, and they're very useful. Because now we didn't need to sit here and compute the force, which incidentally we could as the gradient of this um, potential energy line. But we didn't need to do that. We didn't need to worry about all those details as we move from A to B and figure out the displacement. We haven't even actually figured out what the x coordinate is for either of these points. We haven't bothered to read that off the plot, because all we need to know the fact that the work is equal to the change in kinetic energy, because that's what happens to an object when you do work to it. You make it move, you change its kinetic energy, or you lift it and you change its potential energy. Okay, so that's what work is doing. So then we need one more part to this question, which is asking us about the power that is supplied by this um, source of the potential energy as we move from A to B, if that happens in three seconds. And for that part, we just need to know that power is simply the change in energy over time, which is the work over time. So we just take this 2.25 joules, and we divide it by the time 3, and um, 3 seconds. So we divide that. That's going to be 7 point, what, 7 times 3 is 2.1, that leaves us with 0.15, so 7.05, um, and then joule per second is a watt. Okay, so that's the power. And we've now solved this whole problem based on just looking at this energy figure, uh, energy diagram, and we figured out things about the work, the power, etc., with a little bit of extra information supplied to us for starting and endpoints in the time taken. Okay, so hopefully that helps uh, understand kinetic energy, potential energy, their interrelationship, these diagrams, and how to think about work and power.